welcome to the fourth annual conference of the International Catalogue Resume Association, mm -hmm. also known as ICRA. My name is Teresa Krasny, and I'm chair of ICRA. I'm delighted to see so many of you here in this beautiful room at Cromwell Place, and a warm welcome to everyone joining us online this morning uh, for what promises to be a fascinating day. Our topic, Legacy, the artist's view, is a rich and thought-provoking one. Those of us who author, edit, research, and use catalog resumes know what legacy means to us as we try to put some order to the artist's body of work. But today, we are focusing on what legacy truly means to the artist and the artist's families and their guardians. As we'll hear, legacy can be a gift that's passed on to subsequent generations. It can also be a burden. It is not a static or stable thing, but needs continual development and stewardship as it moves through time from one generation to the next. There are significant practical implications of legacy, um, particularly if the artist has remained silent on the subject during their own lifetime. But there's also a complex philosophical subtext. Where does legacy begin? Is it already in the consciousness of the artist in the act of creation? And is legacy really a linear concept moving from that moment in time to the future and beyond? Or does it move back and forth through time as future guardians look back to mine and interpret the past? Shaping legacy is at least partly within the artist's control before the tide of art history washes over their intentions and preserves their work in aspic. However, not every artist has the opportunity or even wishes to actively engage with their legacy. The aim of this conference today is to peel back the layers that are often imposed on an artist's legacy by the art world. We at ICRA felt it was time within the context of our annual conferences to hand the microphone over to the artist and those that speak for them, to give them the space to articulate their own concept of legacy. We have an extraordinary lineup of speakers, including some of the most important contemporary artists working today. Marina Abramovich, Edmund Duval, Michael Craig Martin, and Rachel Whiteread. We also have Arshal Gorky's granddaughter, Saskia Spender, Maholi Naj's grandson, Daniel Hogg, Frank Bowling's son, Ben, Paul Orego's son, Nick Willing, and Rachel Cherner, the director of the Carolee Schneeman Foundation. We are honored and privileged to have them here. And on behalf of the board, I would like to thank them for their generosity in sharing their insights with us today. The running order of the day is in your conference pack. There will be four sessions in the morning with a coffee break at 12. And then we take time for a quick lunch between 1.30 and 2. Following which we will have three sessions in the afternoon with a very English tea break at 3.30. We will then conclude at five with drinks and I hope you can all stay and join. Some of our speakers, as indicated on the program, are speaking to us virtually as they could not physically be here today. Please do use the Q&A sessions to get the most out of the day. Each session will be introduced by a member of the ICRA board so you can put faces to our names. Please do come up and chat with us in the break. We'd love to talk to you and meet you and we were also very interested in your feedback. If you are not already a member of ICRA, I do hope that you will consider joining. Um, our mission is to raise awareness around the importance of the catalogue resume as a pillar of the artist's legacy, to establish best practice for making one, to create relevant content, and to create a platform for a network of colleagues and peers to interact. We are a non-profit organization. Our existence relies and depends on our membership and sponsors. I would like to take this moment to sincerely thank our very generous sponsors without whom today's conference would not be possible. So a big thank you to Christie's, Constantine Cannon, Navigating Art, Phillips Fiduciary Services, and Sotheby's. 
And now, just before we get started, and speaking of legacy, on behalf of the board, I would like to, to thank Pierre Valentin, our outgoing ICRA chair, for his energy, tenacity in getting this fledgling association off the ground, and for his wisdom and good humor in guiding us over the past five years. ICRA as it is today, Pierre, is part of your legacy. And now, without further ado, I am delighted to welcome my colleague Harriet Bridgman to introduce the first panel. Thank you. I'm delighted to introduce the first panel, A Family Affair, I Never Knew You, a conversation between the grandchildren of two renowned 20th century artists. Saskia Spender is president of the Ashio Gorky Foundation, her grandfather's foundation, whose primary purpose is to complete the catalogue raisonné of the artist's oeuvre. She's not only the granddaughter of Ashio Gorky, but also Stephen Spender, so she has two very strong bows. Um, strings to her grandfather's bows, you put it that way. And Saskia is also a fifth generation, generation artist herself, and I happen to know a very good one. She's also um, a fellow board member of ICRA and makes a great contribution. Daniel Hug is a grandson of the Hungarian constructivist and the Bauhaus artist, Laszlo Moholinag. Um, he's a board member and secretary of the Moholinag Foundation, and he's been a director of Art Cologne since 2008. Now I'll hand over to Saskia and Daniel, and thank you both so much for enabling us to hear and be part of your fascinating conversation, which I know it will be. <laughs> Daniel, I feel I have to thank you for coming to London because you've come all the way from Colne. Uh, well, I only came from Shepherd's Bush. <laughs> it's been easier for me than for you. So thank you for being here. Um, you were running the, you are running the Cologne Art Festival, right? The fair. Yes. Yeah, that is that is your work today. But um, uh, you bring all sorts of experiences to uh, managing your grandfather's uh, legacy. Um, you lived, you were brought up in America, and you were an art dealer for a while, and you went to the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, yes, yes. Do, do you find that uh, uh, bringing different experiences uh, from other areas of your life uh, helps in um, uh, taking care of the legacy of uh, Moholy Naji? I think so. I think uh, for uh, the, uh, yeah, I, my interest in art was, uh, was developed early on. Uh, visiting exhibitions of Maholi Naj around the world with my parents, uh, being bored to death. Uh, I know every single uh, museum bench yeah. <laughs> in, in pretty much every museum around the world. Um, I thought it was natural. I thought it was normal. I know, I'm, I'm sure you uh, felt the same uh, growing up. Definitely. That everyone had a famous artist in the family or? Well, I don't know if I thought that everyone had a famous artist in the family because I was growing up in a small village in Tuscany at a time when the first tractors were arriving and those were my school friends. I did know that most people did what their parents did. So my parents did what their parents did, and I did what my parents did. And that's the way, just like the cobbler's child did what his dad did. Mm. Um, so I knew that not everyone, but I completely relate to the running around museums. Mm. And I knew that wherever I was in the world, I could go to a museum and no matter who was on the wall, I could be at home there and I could see something that would make me feel at home in some way. Yeah, there was lots of great art on the actual home walls. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was good. And surely you've done the same to your children. You've taken your kids yes. to the same and Yes, of course. And uh do they find them boring or are we parenting differently these days, do you reckon? No, my my <laughs> I have an eight-year-old son and he knows the museum benches in the museum Ludwig quite well. And uh, 
Yeah, it's that Museum Ludwig has a beautiful uh, early constructivist painting by Maholi Naj that you know we visit at least a couple times a year. And uh, I say that's you know painting by your great grandfather, and uh, he's kind of like, anyway. So, uh, Arshil Gorky. Yeah, uh, we when when we spoke on the phone, we discovered that our grandparents, as such different artists, have so many things in common, and it really reminded me uh, how every artist, just like the artist's children and grandchildren lives in a certain generation and actually our grandparents were only born about 10 years apart mm. and so they both experienced the collapse of empires and they ended up both changing their names and emigrating and in different circumstances but yeah they have all of this in common and that's purely generational yes i think what's interesting is the idea of uh I think both Maholi Naj and, and uh, Arshil Gorky uh, had a profound awareness of the artist, uh, you know, as the complete image of artists. So even uh, down to the name, and Arshil yeah. Gorky changed his name. Yeah. Uh, Maholi Naj was born uh, Laszlo Weiss in 1895 in what was then the Austro Hungarian Empire. Uh, was to a well-to-do uh, reformed Jewish family. Uh, his father took off, disappeared in his childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, family law was that he had uh, traveled to the United or emigrated to the United States uh, when in fact he had just moved to the neighboring village and took up a new family. And so I think that that kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, Put a pause in 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 having any sort of allegiance uh, to his religion or to his his uh, paternal family. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he he intended to he wanted to study law and he began studying. Well, he he uh, <clears throat> converted to Christianity uh, in order to be able to attend university to study law, and then World War One broke out, and it was during his convalescence from being wounded by shrapnel uh, that he decided to become an artist. And that, yeah, that was, I think, 1918, 1919. He moved to Vienna, uh, was bored with Vienna, found it to be very uh, stagnant, uh, not very progressive, and then moved to Berlin in 1920. Uh, where he then found success as an artist, uh, showing with uh, the Girl It Gallery uh, for his first show, and then with uh, Herval Walden's Der Storm in, I think, 1922. In 1923, he was hired by Walter Gropius uh, to take over the metal shop in the, uh, the uh, first year foundation class at the Bauhaus in Weimar. And Maholi stayed at the Bauhaus uh, through its transition to Dessau. And then uh, in solidarity with Walter Gropius, when Walter Gropius was asked to leave the Bauhaus in, I think, 1927, uh, 28, uh, Maholi left the Bauhaus as well and set up his uh, uh, design practice uh, in Berlin in 1928. Well, I mean, Gorky, and now that you mention it, also had the betrayal of the father, the absent betraying father. In his case, his father really had gone to America and uh, from, from Lake Van in present day Turkey. So there are these changing boundaries, these changing national boundaries that also, I mean, at the time it was the Ottoman Anat Ottoman Anatolia, it was the same country as Syria. Um, and he went to America after spending sort of 18 months as a, well, he experienced the Armenian genocide and uh, with his younger sister who is a surviving relative, 
uh, he wound up in a displaced person camp for 18 months in Istanbul. And when he was 16, he managed to get onto a boat and get to America with the help of a half-sister who was already in America. And um, apparently he already knew he was going to be an artist. Um, we don't know really how uh, literate he was, but he could, to a certain extent, read and write. Um, and uh, by the time he was 19, he was uh, no longer living with relatives. Uh, he was enrolling in uh, art school in Boston and earning his fee by teaching art in Boston. And he moved to New York City. Again, mm -hmm. Boston was very provincial. He moved to New York City, which was his Berlin, I guess, uh, in uh, 1920, something between 24 and 25. And he was probably around 21, 22. We don't really have uh, documents confirming his birth. Um, and uh, again, he started supporting himself as a teacher and uh, being, being an artist. And being an artist means not only um, working at art, but in also and supporting your practice and possibly other ways like teaching art, but also getting your work in important collections. And he did that from the very beginning already in the, 20s, uh, he, in 1926, uh, when he had barely been in New York, um, Joseph Hershon, who was known for bulk buying, came to his studio and bought, the, bought 12 works, uh, which are still the basis of the Gorky collection in the, in the Hershon uh, Museum. And he found an early patron in Mrs. Whitney, and so uh, Whitney gave him his first kind of museum group show um, in the mid thirties. Mm -hmm. So, and he was very central to the whole kind of downtown um, avant-garde milieu uh, where many, many artists were like him had it migrated and so were aware of living in existing in different worlds and in some way mediating different dimensions and so I think he really had this um his, a part of his drive was to feel that he was mediating between kind of an eternal world where art existed and that lived mostly in the Metropolitan Museum with works from all over the world, different eras, different people, different ways of looking at the world, but a similar way of tuning into the kind of more spiritual, I think, side, for want of a better word, of art and communicating that to the present generations and the key of his own time. And that's in a sense a little bit what we do when we take up the legacy of, of, of our grandparents is that we, um, I, it's reinterpreting them is too strong a word, mm. possibly, but represent them, re represent them to our current times. Um, because however eternal the aspirations of artists, well, you know, the world of the dead is very crowded and gets more and more crowded. Mm. And, uh, and uh, we have to carry them into the world of the living. <laughs> I think also to kind of put the puzzle pieces together yeah. and try and make sense of the time. Um, what, I, what I noticed was, uh, I mean, Julian Levy, the gallerist, uh, New York gallerist, was an early supporter of Maholi, visited Maholi in 1930 in Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, Maholi took him to a, a, a nudist beach, which Julian Levy thought was really fantastic. And then... <laughs> And uh, in 31, uh, Julian Levy showed, uh, presented Maholi's uh, first show of photography in New York. And I saw that Julian Levy was also a, a very early supporter of uh, Corky. Yeah, yeah, his first proper 
dealer, really. Mm. I mean, there was an, a, another dealer briefly who gave him an exhibition in Baltimore. But uh, yeah, Julian Levy famously, um, uh, when he first met Gorky, Gorky had been sort of uh, hovering in his gallery and he was a very distinctive physical presence. He was very tall and he liked to dress quite theatrically with a over large coat. Mm. Uh, partly it was the depression. People didn't have new clothes in those days, but partly it was really his choice to occupy as much space as possible. Wow. Uh, so uh, people used to say that when he when he leant over to look at a, a book or a vitrine in Julian Levy's gallery, you could see the whole coat crumple beneath him because it was so enormous. <laughs> wow. wow. So, so this was part of his sort of quite theatrical look. And uh, so he'd go in and look at Julian Levy's surrealist magazines. Um, and one day Julian Levy said, so Arshil Gorky, um, uh, you've been working, your work looks a lot like um, Picasso's. And he says, yes, for a long time I was with Cezanne. And then I was with, um, what do you say, Uccello. And now, of course, I am with Picasso. And so Julian Levy said, well, come back when you are with Gorky, which <laughs> felt... <laughs> quite cutting and mm. so didn't go back for about a year <laughs> so but he... then he got his first show in new york from julian levy interesting about the theater i didn't know that about the theatrical sort of dressing because maholi did that as well at the Bauhaus. he um he, he always wore a oh these sort of workers overalls coveralls uh and we never really knew what color because all the, the photographs are black and white. And it turned out it was bright red. Oh, so wow. So he would wear a suit and tie. Uh, and then over this, he would have his pristine sort of workers uh, red overall. And he would paint in it, but, you know, not getting paint. At, you know, he's a very meticulous, yeah. clean painter. Um, but both Maholi and, and, and Gorky died early. Maholi in 1946, Gorky in 1948. Yeah. Um, so we're I talking know, about 20 years of work, really. Yeah. But also, I mean, I, I know that my, my grandmother did a lot for him. It was, uh, Sybil uh, was the second wife of Maholi, and he had two children with her, my mother and uh, my aunt Claudia, who unfortunately passed away in, in the 1960s or sorry 70 um but so everything kind of you know the whole the art was preserved mm -hmm. and the whole archive of photography things that didn't have a, a monetary value and photography and there wasn't a market for photography until the 1960s 70s um, a lot of it got lost, and a lot of it was given away. Um, my grandmother only kept the personal correspondence, not the professional correspondence. So we have, you know, a stack of letters bet between Maholi and and uh, and Sybil. But the the really the stuff that would be really helpful to running a foundation yeah. or an estate of an artist uh, was pretty much gone. My my mother inherited the estate then in 1970 upon Sybil's death, or 71, sorry. And uh, over the last 48 years, kind of pieced together a lot of the archives. So uh, getting, a, it's mostly Xeroxes. There's some, about 10%, original material and then about yeah it's just a, a lot of xeroxes the archive but interesting you know yeah. correspondence and uh, exhibitions and stuff like that so you're lucky that they actually are written documents uh, gorky is somebody who left no written documents there's a stack of postcards to his sister 
And in fact, the lack of story or written history um, is one of the one of the difficulties with uh, with Gorky. He, this was clearly something that was very in, intentional. Uh, my grandmother, also a second wife, also mother of two girls, um, also a young widow. She was 19 when she met him and 27 when he died. Uh, she also dispersed lots of things. Um, and nothing really had a monetary value, but I think she felt the aesthetic value. So the work mostly remained with her, partly because one of Gorky's friends, the mosaic artist Jean Reynal, um, went and retrieved the work. Uh, Magouche went away um, uh, with her kids, uh, my mother and her younger sister, to put them in an orphanage. And uh, the, the Jeanne went and collected all the work, but the studio was dispersed, you know, the paints were given away. Um, and the only things that remained were these kind of written documents that remained were some postcards to Magouche and postcards to his sister, which were written in their language, um, which is a kind of Armenian that was only spoken in a part that was then ethnically cleansed and therefore doesn't even resemble uh, Armenian. Uh, it was a very local language. And these letters were then translated in a forged way by this sister's son who had Armenian nationalist aspirations and who presented his illustrious uncle posthumously as uh, the sort of kind of maudlin Armenian nationalist, which wasn't at all the personality that his contemporaries had witnessed and didn't really reflect his intentions at all. And in the absence of a, of a um, narrative that was closer to Gorky himself, because my grandmother wasn't saying anything, this nephew was inventing things, in the absence of that, the legacy got slightly kind of misplaced, mm. let's say. Uh, and, and it was only when my dad uh, had these postcards retranslated and finding someone who actually knew that language was really quite difficult. Eventually, somebody was found in the um, Armenian community in Venice. Um, who was very old, they turned out to be completely mundane, such as, ah, oh, sorry, you don't have any money this Christmas. <laughs> I'm having a hard time to... <laughs> uh, I hope your kid gets better <laughs> and see you maybe next year. <laughs> so, so, yeah, the very little texts remain... Uh, so only the art remains, and the art history got slightly frozen in around in the kind of decades after Gorky's death. And actually, really, it was the moment Gorky got slightly kind of. Um, it was obvious that he ought to be included, that his work ought to be included in America's self-presentation as a place of progress after the Second World War. And so he was included in the MoMA traveling show that went all around the world and introduced audiences to uh, abstract expressionism, uh, the New American, New American Painting, I think it was called, mm. um, uh, in 1958, which was actually... 10 years after his death. So, you know, not that new. Um, but, uh, and he, he, there he was presented as someone who had something in common with surrealism and something in common with abstract expressionism before it existed. Mm. So a kind of uh, a pivotal figure, let's say. Um, and it's been really... Uh, I mean, the, the, the fact that there's been very little kind of uh, art history about Gorky 
due to the lack of texts and due to his early death relative to the art historical movements he's been placed in, um, has actually given my generation a chance to look at him completely fresh and find so many contemporary resonances because we're missing the whole the whole generation where his story would be passed on actually we're missing you know the generation of my parents partly because my grandmother unlike yours lived a really long time and the the story that she was interested in saying was the story of her youth so she contributed unconsciously to keeping him in a place and time. Uh, and it's only now, and it's only really the artists who continued through, through the era, you know, the artists like Cy Twombly and Helen Frank and Thala, and then more contemporary artists like, uh, um, I think that, the, well, Jack Whitten, Mm. Uh, who worked in the 60s and 70s and 80s, 90s, so more contemporary. He carried Gorky through. Um, and it's really been the artists who have carried his legacy through. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think with Maholi as well. It's, uh, and Maholi had the privilege of, of having uh, quite, being quite successful in the 1920s. Uh, as a as an artist uh working with important galleries at the time yeah. and then spending let's say the 1930s fighting it so of course there was the uh the the depression yeah um i think i think the market was very similar today that you had this very small one percent of the upper crust the super rich that were buying art and it wasn't really some it wasn't really an activity for you know day-to-day -day people mm -hmm. um so of course a lot of wealth was lost uh with the depression but um anyway moholy declared painting dead i think in 1932 sorry no 29 he declared painting dead and then only to resume painting in 1931 so you know there was a it, it kind of suited his needs, yeah. but but uh, an artist uh, market, let's say, comes in waves. It you know it moves up and down. Uh, Moholy was he was quite well known when he when he arrived in the United States in 1937, and then. Uh, as an artist, and and then in the fifties, it kind of weaned. In the late sixties, seventies, there was a revival and a great general interest in uh, constructivism. And uh, of course, it kind of fit together well with the, the the following generations, like Max Bill and you know the Swiss uh, concrete artists and minimalism these sort of outgrowths. And so it's, it's. but one thing that Moholy did write a lot of texts. I mean, that was something he had a, a lot of help with, uh, with his first wife, Lucia, uh, with, with Sybil, who was, uh, she didn't, Sybil, I think, uh, managed to, uh, from a well-to-do German Gentile family, uh, she finished, uh, she did finishing school, uh, but she could read and write very well. Yeah. Um, so she helped him a great deal. Uh, Maholi always, uh, he suffered from, I think his German as well, with, with a heavy Hungarian accent. And then when he moved to the United States, he also uh, had, had this uh, Hungarian accent mixed with German, uh, which uh, anyway, uh, the, that's a whole other thing, but I think the, uh, I mean, today it's, it's, uh, I think in the U S he's more well known as a photographer in Germany is more known as the, the Bauhaus master, uh, 
in fact, he himself saw himself as an artist, mm. not a designer, not an architect, not a photographer. Um, yeah. I first encountered Moholy Nash's work in the catalog of the 1982 uh, Venice Photography Biennale. My parents had gone, they brought back this catalog, and this was, you know, the new books that I just absorbed. And so I saw his photographs first. Um, I remember. <laughs> yeah, so, well, uh, Gorky was anti text which makes collecting a catalogue resume and archive incredibly difficult. It ends up being only the uh, information really and none of the objects. So particularly well suited to a digital catalogue resume, which is what we ended up doing. So Xeroxes, digital copies of Xeroxes would completely fit in this mm. kind of scheme of things of organizing things yeah so far we've only have a catalog resume a published printed catalog resume of the photograms uh and that was i think published about five years ago six years ago and and even that there's uh photograms have resurfaced that we didn't know about right uh, so that's Quite that definitely. Uh, I think I think uh, uh, an online catalog resume makes sense. We're working. My my wife is now the director of the foundation. Um, I I was director for about three four years. Uh, between my other work, it was really hard to to kind of get things moving. Uh, my my wife Natalia has done a really fantastic job. She's revamped the website, uh, and. She's working on assembling images, uh, information on, on paintings. We hope to do a, to start soon with putting together a catalog resume for the paintings and drawings. And uh, yeah, that's a huge thing. It is a huge thing. <laughs> It, daunting. Yeah, it is daunting. It is daunting. <clears throat> it is daunting, but it's something that for us has been really useful. And uh, we published our catalog resume online. There's still two or three important collections missing for completely bureaucratic reasons, such as not signing of release forms. Yeah. I mean, it's literally that one of the important collections that's missing is the uh, collection that uh, my grandmother gave Gorky's sister, the mother of the forgerer. Uh, and she, the, the, she ended up giving it to her Armenian church. And of course, it's a very splintered mm. scene in these churches and they're not really co collectors. So at first they were just keeping them in the damp basement of a church. And then somebody who had an art history degree went there and said, hmm, I don't think this is the right conservation. Have you thought of storing them in a nice Armenian foundation like the Gulbenkian in Lisbon? So that's where they've ended up. But the, the terms of the storage are that they should not be exhibited. So... <laughs> They, you know, kept and we managed to get them out occasionally for exhibitions. Uh, but that, that means that we have no one's had a chance to of looking at the whole collection. Mm. And we're still waiting um, for our authentication panel, which is not called authentication, it's called a review panel because we're a US based foundation. And the mere concept of authentication has got legal um problems uh yeah. in the states and u.s jurisdictions but in essence that is what is going on there with the with the inclusion panel the review panel for inclusion and the catalog isn't it and i really think that that is the you could summarize the roles that we have uh, 
that our generation has as continuing the dispersal of the works, uh, which does have a commercial side to it, which is good because it can help fund mm. these less commercial and very important archiving and cataloging efforts. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't concentrate on the kind of commercial aspect uh, of dispersing, of managing an estate as kind of really the most important. I know that we no. live in an era where, where that the market is the dominant metaphor. Who knows how long for? Uh, well, I think you know the yeah, it's it's a tough one. I think the the market kind of determines what's relevant today but not only not only i know it's but not, a lot of not it, the only boy. a lot of it and i think with american institutions it it really it's it's kind of determined by the the benefactors of the museums whatever they buy whatever yeah. they donate the museum has to take even goes through the review board but with I mean, my but those boards themselves are currently undergoing a bit of a crisis it because is. I mean everything, the, the entire kind of uh, uh, finance of the art sphere. Yeah. Not just I mean the galleries are doing okay because they're out there to make money and that is their mm. their raison d'être and so they're cons consistent in their approach. But the museums, in the absence of Kind of clean public funding for the arts mm. have found themselves embroiled in in all sorts of kind of board issues yeah so the, they end up touching a lot of sort of cultural things and i think that that's part of the kind of soup that contributes to the kind of um art sphere um, yeah. in which we have to swim in mm. some way with maholi uh my grandmother, Sybil, did the dispersal of the, the bulk of the uh, estate in the 1950s and 60s, partially restocking the museums in Europe, in Germany and France that were emptied by the Nazis mm -hmm. uh, in the 1940s. I mean, during World War II, uh, there, there was a market for Cezanne. There was a market for even for Picasso. Uh, the the Nazis didn't burn the castles. Yeah. They they sent them through their you know gray channels to to dealers in France and the U S in 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 Great Britain. Uh, with with geometric abstract art like Maholi, it was just burned. It was it didn't have a market value yeah. at that time, and it was just destroyed. It was a uh, you know a nice way for the Nazis to make a political statement. Yeah banned literature and these, you know, and art of the cons where they would just burn it. Um, so what my what what was great that Sybil did, she threw a, actually through Gurla in the beginning yeah. and then to a, a dealer named uh Clean in Munich, she sold to a lot of the the German museums that were rebuilding their collections after the war. And of course Moholy was still a big name and that had to go into the collection. So you you can visit pretty much every major museum in Germany has a, a Maholi Nage painting. Great. Uh, photography then came a bit later. Um, but Maholi from 1930 was very critical of the, the commercial market and refused to, to uh, be represented by a gallery. Mm -hmm. And he had offers from very prominent galleries. Even my grandmother continued that and had a very close working relationship with Anna Lee Judah here in London, uh, starting in the 1950s or uh, 60s. Uh, and still today, we're, we're working probably most closely with, with David Judah. We did have a foray with House of Earth, where we did a beautiful show, um, which was fantastic. And I think you know, you can see a little bump in the market or a little, little more interest suddenly. Mm -hmm. So it is a it is a combination, you know, a balance between the the commercial world and the uh, the you know nonprofit world. Yeah, yeah. This the 
clearly every generation reinterprets the role in light of our own moment. Mm. It appears we've become more systematic than the generations. Oh, no. <laughs> well, you know, one thing that, that's, that's very, what, what I've noticed uh -huh. is, is in terms of research, yes, you know, there's the academic side, but there are a few specialized dealers, especially in, in photography, uh, Thomas Derda in Berlin, who just co-curated a, a beautiful exhibition uh, of Lucia Maholi, of Maholi's first wife at the Brohan Museum in Berlin, really worth looking at. Um, but what's interesting is that a lot of, we, we get a lot of information from dealers, from, from art dealers. Uh, so, and so I, I do think it's, it's really important to kind of preserve these, these relationships or to, to, how do you say, encourage them. Um, Definitely openness. Forgeries, for example. Yeah, forgery is a big deal. Yeah, big problem. Big problem. That's... I think it's especially for artists like, like Gorky and, and Maholi, who are names, but, you know, you can't really visualize, I mean, not everyone can, you know, puts, it's not like, you you know, you can't really forge a Picasso because the the, the I'm most, sure uh, people do. You know, yeah, I'm sure they do, but. Because these forgers, they're not but, very good. I mean, the forgeries, you can generally. Some are, yes, 90, I would say 90% are terrible. And, and, you know, we know Maholi's work and looking at it, you know, growing up with it and looking at it your entire life, you can easily recognize, it's a gut feeling, you know, a lot of times, uh, like that's not, you know, or the little things, the yeah, signature. Yeah, those gut feelings indicated. are really expensive. It's, well, I, I find it's really important. Gut feelings are definitely there, but yeah. they're, they're the sort of synthetic version of all the other feelings. But for us, it's really work to have a panel of experts, art historians, curators, and uh, uh, conservators who have been doing it now for quite a long time and who are able to go through the authentication process in a very systematic way. Uh, and if that process, this is why we get stuck with, you know, prima facie completely legitimate collections like the Armenian diocese collection mm. that we can't include because you we've seen estates where they haven't been so formal and systematic about it and haven't necessarily taken the best legal advice and have found themselves sued mm. for enormous sums of money so I find that being really having really clear uh, guidelines for how mm. to manage that side of it is really important, super important for a catalog resume. Definitely, definitely. Um, for now, it's it's still my mother who is sort of the, the final say. Mm -hmm. um, and in those few questions where we're unsure, or, I mean, again, 90% of the forgeries we see are readily identifiable and you recognize it immediately but there are always a few where you're just unsure you're like could be maybe what's yeah. what's missing here yeah um and for that my my mother has an advisory board of of five uh art historians academics moholy experts yeah uh, and then she she puts it into the uh into scrutiny with them and to come up with something. We don't officially do authentications and we do not state that something is a forgery mm -hmm. officially. In, you know, with the 90% the, the obvious forgeries, we tell them, look, that's a for that's not by the hand of Maholi and forget mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. You should burn it. And, Mm -hmm. Throw it away. Uh, of course, those expensive ones, the big ones, 
the viable ones, <laughs> the ones that might be real. Mm -hmm. Those are the difficult ones. Yeah. For that, you need an advisory board. Yeah. You need to have, and even even then, we do not, you know, say that that it's a forgery. Mm -hmm. Especially, I think with the the higher priced items as uh, as well. I mean, that's where you're putting yourself at risk. Mm -hmm. Um, there are three. Uh, forgeries that have been in museum shows yeah that have been in existence for 20 30 years again i said there was a revival in the 1960s 70s suddenly there were you know yeah the forgeries come out yeah and there's suddenly a, a a rediscovery of an artist that yeah the forgers get busy yeah um we have a forger who's gorky's contemporary in oh. fact a former student yeah. And he has works in every museum around the world. Mm. Very minor works. There was, there's, yeah, it's sad. But I, I mean, there, you know, there was a case where there was a, uh, we just had a, a, a Mahoy uh, retrospective at the Guggenheim in New York, at LACMA, and at the Art Institute in Chicago. And there was, I, actually, it, it wasn't that show. It was, I think, in Frankfurt about 10 years ago, there was a show, a, a retrospective show. And my mother had told the curator, that's a forgery. I'm pretty sure. Don't put it in. And it was put in, which is unfortunate. Yeah. That for whatever reason. Um, but let's talk about what, I what are you... I think it's pass the baton to the children. <laughs> how aside from dialogue well, it up. <laughs> where uh, oh well i mean that's where an archive is useful yeah that's where you you know you have pages from uh auction house catalogs at least yeah and you you document the trails yeah of legitimate works through the market as well as uh the forgeries yeah. Any any work that doesn't have a provenance is highly suspect. And I'm always baffled. I'm like, you don't know where you got it from. Yeah. <laughs> How can you not know? It's like I know oh, look what we found in the attic. <laughs> educating the collectors, really. Yeah. And apart from catalog resume, how are you um, looking at the future? Oh, I don't know. Uh, we're, we're still working, but I feel it's time to open this up to questions. If anyone has any question, yeah. So I'm interested in a similar thing. What is your strategy, really, in terms of looking at the future and what kind of projects you look at first, and what the kind of the uh, order is, you know, whether it's, whether it's exhibitions or whether it's monographs. We've got everything going on. We've, we've got everything, right? We, we carry on talking to museums, to private galleries. We have exhibition programs. We have anniversaries. We have symposia in the... Well, I think, I think there's two, uh, a diff uh, difference between the two estates here. Yeah. And one is that you still have a large... Uh, volume of work yeah and we on the other hand it's kind of been whittled down over the years i mean my my grandmother was very good at dispersing the stuff to important institutions and my my mother has sold stuff here and there um i mean we have about i don't know 20 paintings 400 photographs photograms stuff like that i mean considering the the output of an artist it's not a lot that we have left mm -hmm. so we're looking we've been looking at alternative other things i mean my my mother in the in the 80s put out a lot of uh did a lot of additions with griffelkunz uh it's a, an organization in germany uh with a large member <laughs> they're open ended additions I think the members number maybe 2,000, 1,000. Um, they're not allowed to sell them, but they all end up on eBay for some reason. Um, uh -oh. So that was that, you know, and, and some of the, the 
so some of the bigger uh, blue chippy uh, photo dealers uh, are like, you know, that was a mistake. This is really watered down the market. But it, it, it's it's odd when you look at auction records from a whole and you see a, a photogram for, or you see a, a vintage photograph from the 1940s for 400,000. And then next to it, you see a Griffel Kunst edition from 1985 for $230. Uh, so that, that for the, I think the novice art person or collector, it's confusing. Yeah. And even, I think I, in Maholi's case, there's also, you know, you have the vintage uh, photographs or cameraless photographs made without a camera. So they're unique. Maholi had them reshot with a copy stand to have a negative. And then he would reprint them, rework them, improve them. And he saw them all as equal, but they all have different values today. Um, the original, of course, is worth a lot. The vintage photogram, the vintage photograph of a photogram is also worth a lot, but not as much as the original photogram and et cetera. It kind of moves down the road in how it's it's uh, reproduced. This is changed, the reproduced. thing that um, Catalog Risen is really good at clarifying yeah, for yeah. collectors because then they can start educating themselves to the difference between editions and and uh, single yeah yeah we i mean we have uh we have a photograms catalog resume you know another thing that 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 uh recently came up and that was i think this was something oh you know we had two academics who wrote uh part of the me too movement uh wrote uh papers so lucia maholi was uh a, a very talented, gifted photographer in her own right. She died in, I think, 1980-something. I forgot when she died. But upon the death of Sybil, my grandmother, in 1971, in a year later, Lucia published a book. And this is when there was this huge revival of constructivism, of Bauhaus, of Maholi. Mm -hmm. And she, she said... It was called Marginal Notes on Maholi. And she wrote that she was a collaborator with Maholi and that a lot of the works were authored by her. Yeah, basically. She said, they forgot about me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, she waited. Which... My grandmother would have killed her. But anyway, so after my, Sybil was a very tough German woman. Anyway, she, great architecture critic. She wrote a, a wonderful uh, Sorry, I won't get into that. Anyway, <laughs> the, uh, so there was a, an academic a few years ago, I won't say her name, but wrote a, a whole thesis yeah, that, that Maholi, uh, that, that Lucia and Maholi made photograms together. And she proved this by, there's a, a double portrait where you see Lucia, you have Lucia's head and Maholi's head next to each other and Maholi did a, the darkroom work he left to others yeah a lot of it was done by Lucia the photograms he did himself but the developing which is you know take the sheet of paper and you put it in yeah. the developer then you wash it you put it in the fixer okay. you hang it up you flatten it whatever anyway so this went as far as the Museum Ludwig doing a show and in a grand statement, reassigning, you know, re, re uh, assigning the famous double portrait photogram as a work by Lucia and Laszlo. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's, it's the funny thing is, you know, we have this catalog resume. I mean, there's one simple proof. We have a catalog resume of photograms, of photographs starting in the 19, uh, early 20s and going all the way to Moholy's death in 1946. Mm -hmm. And Moholy never stopped making photograms. Mm -hmm. And seeing them chronologically, you can see a clear development mm -hmm. and of different objects he began using, of how they go from being very hard edge, geometric, abstract, to kind of more biomorphic and free flow. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Lucia never made another photogram after she divorced Laszlo. Hmm. Not in existence. Not one photogram. Which proves, yeah, that this is Maholi's idea. This is Maholi's Quite photogram. Indicative. But anyway, in light of this Me Too movement, this attempt, it's been really sad. And even, you know, Maholi, uh, Lucia had to, had to escape the Nazis before Maholi uh, because she was, she was involved with a, a communist. And anyway, she emigrated, I think, to, to London. Or no, she went back to Czechoslovakia and then asked Maholi to hold on to her negatives. And Lucia did all those fantastic photographs of the Bauhaus that we know, those beautiful black and white photographs of the Bauhaus. Right, right, right. And so she asked Maholi to hold on to her negatives. And he said he would. And then a few years later, Maholi had to emigrate because of the Nazis. And he gave them to Walter Gropius, who then emigrated to the United States and took them with him. So when Maholi moved to the United States to run the, to open the new Bauhaus in Chicago, an experimental design school, he invited Lucia to come to the school and teach photography. The American immigration authorities turned down her request because of the communist affiliation, which passed on from the Nazis to the US. Um, but anyway, it was a, a, a long legal battle between uh, Lucia and Sybil trying to get the, 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 the negatives back from Walter Gropius, who in, I think it, it was in 19, ooh, late 30s, early 40s, that MoMA did a big Bauhaus show where the photos were then published again and uncredited to Lucia. Anyway, that was just a little side note that it feels good to get that out. Yeah. <laughs> well, Daniel, um, thank you so much oh, for you. side notes and uh, front notes too. <laughs>